Would you like to see a film where Namor the Submariner makes his live-action debut as he threatens to go to war with the Black Panther if the Black Panther doesn't help him destroy Iron Man as well as the rest of the surface world? That sounds pretty exciting, right? Well, with Wakanda Forever, we basically get the bargain bin version of that story. Instead of Black Panther, we get Shuri. Instead of Iron Man, we get Iron Heart. And instead of Namor the Submariner, King of Atlantis, we get Kuku Khan. My people call me Ah Kuku Khan. Sometimes called Namur, King of Wet Pandora. Seriously, the only resemblance Namor and Namur have are that they wear the same color dundies. For those who aren't familiar, Namor is one of the first ever anti heroes in comics, first being created all the way back in the 1930s. He generally acts in the best interests of Atlantis, but he's a hard dude with a really bad attitude, one that often puts him at odds with pretty much everyone, but he's powerful enough to get away with it, and people are often eager to get him on their side in any major conflict. Oh, oh, Namor, could you help us? Oh, actually, could you be on our team? Hmm, let me think about it. Nah. <laughs> Imperious Rex. Good job. Namur is woefully soft in both body and mind. He isn't imposing or intimidating, and he has little to no presence when he's on screen. Instead of being an angry, powerful tyrant, he comes off as more of a sad marshmallow. His body language doesn't suggest that he wants to wreak vengeance on the surface world. It feels like he would rather wreak vengeance on a Starbucks employee for getting his name wrong. They tease how powerful Namor could be, but when he has a chance to show off, he'll do one or two fancy moves, then he'll literally just freeze in place so the rest of the plot can move forward. And to add further insult, they give him the same dry weakness as Aquaman. They copy the competition in spite of the fact that they came first and did it better. He is overwhelmingly mid. He isn't Namor in any way. Way, and that concept extends to this film at large, in the sense that it resembles Marvel Comics so faintly that it would be dishonest to call these things the same. On top of that, Wakanda Forever takes forever to get through. The film is almost three hours long, and you really feel it. And it's really a shame because the story is a great concept. The powerful nation of Wakanda is going to finally meet their match when the hidden nation of Atlantis emerges and challenges them for supremacy. They don't call it Atlantis in the film, but that's what it's supposed to be, so that's what I'm going to call it. The problem with this story lies in its execution. Wakanda and fake Atlantis are presented as these perfect utopias with no flaws whatsoever. Only Namur doesn't like that every other country owns slaves at some point, so he wants to wipe them all out. No, really. That's the motive. To be clear, the Atlanteans never got enslaved. He's mad that other people got enslaved. But Shuri doesn't want a world war to start, so she and Wakanda stand against him. They begin to have little skirmishes until the film ends with them choosing peace over unnecessary destruction. There's a great lesson here that could be taught, but it gets completely missed due to the writer's pretentious desire to make all their characters virtuous and good. If Wakanda and Atlantis were both flawed nations at the brink of war, it would be compelling to suggest that they could forgive and forget their past mistakes for the sake of providing peace for future generations. Wakanda is inherently selfish for keeping its vibranium all to itself, and refusing to share because they think all the other countries are too stupid or evil to handle such material, failing to recognize the benefits from medicine, transportation, and safety that these things could provide for the world. But instead of addressing this as a problem, the film suggests that the Wakandans are right, because they are, in fact, all good and all virtuous. But it just makes the story feel cheap and unfair. Wakandans are simply better people than everyone else. No nuance or depth to be found. Not to mention, this film has a passive resentment for Americans and white people at large throughout the entire story, calling them names like colonizers, blaming them for the world's problems, and suggesting that they can't share power because they'd only use it for evil. It's incredibly alienating and eye-rolling. It's like if someone made fun of you for having a lame car, but then they brag because they drew a picture of a made-up car that looks cooler. It's not interesting to just decide that your made-up country is perfect. Marvel Comics originally got famous by making characters who acted heroic in spite of their many, many flaws. There was a real opportunity here to take a deep dive into the pros and cons that come from bearing the weight of being a world super power. Wakandans look down on and shame Americans, while failing to realize the faults of their own nation. They're isolationists. They're a monarchy that values trial by combat to crown its leader. They don't respect international law. And spears are not superior to firearms. It is silly to suggest otherwise. These things are not practical in the modern world even with vibranium. If Namor wants to destroy the surface world because of past mistakes, then the natural resolution is for Shuri to point out that Wakanda and Atlantis have numerous skeletons in their own closets. And despite how powerful a country might be, and despite how much good it could provide, it will always be run by imperfect humans that don't always do right. But instead of holding grudges and seeking revenge through war, we could all learn from our collective past mistakes and move forward by building a better world together. They also somehow managed to make a brewing war between two super countries, 
feel boring and small. Each battle consists of about 30 people or less on each team. It feels like the producers couldn't afford enough extras to pull off the scale that this story demands. Which is odd, because you'd think that Disney and Marvel would have no trouble covering the budget for these productions. Whatever the reason may be, you'll see more devastating battles at a LARPing convention. The nearly 30-year-old Braveheart blows this film out of the water in terms of scale. Wakanda and Atlantis are hyped up to be the greatest nations in the world, but when we see them in action, they come off as laughably small in number and lacking in resources. And aside from some dynamic shots and set pieces, these battles feel largely the same. We could have had the two countries parallel each other in similar but different tactics and culture, as their brewing conflict escalates from one-on-one -on -one skirmishes to full-scale battles, showing that they are two sides of the same coin, being both powerful and flawed. The film plays with this concept a bit, but only on a shallow level, mostly being jam-packed in a very on-the-nose montage at the way end of the film. You see, Namor? We're both alike because we both have mothers. There's also an interesting and surprisingly well-made one-on-one fight between a Koye and an Atlantean, where they have an honorable but vicious back and forth before it gets interfered with. And it almost seems like they form an unspoken bond, being two of the best warriors from their respected peoples, unable to get a clear one-up on each other, but also unwilling to cheat for a victory. However, the story falls very flat on the payoff for this, where instead of building a friendship out of these enemies turned allies, Okoye just gets a super suit for the rematch, then just slaps this guy around and talks trash to him when she wins. Again, we lose nuance over the need to make Wakandans the best. Speaking of the best, Ironheart is here. <laughs> And there's not much to say that would surprise you. She's a newer, better Iron Man. She's kind, smart, powerful, and perfect in every way. Why? Because her teacher told her she couldn't do it. It feels like Ironheart is only in this film for the sole purpose of setting up the next product. But she doesn't have a lot of direction or purpose in this current film, so she just kind of floats around in the background. She's here because she invented technology that could potentially expose the existence of Atlantis to the outside world. So Namur wants to kill her to prevent that from happening. But Shuri does not want her to die, so a fight begins. Speaking of Shuri, her arc in this story directly mimics Ellie's story from The Last of Us 2. Namur kills her mother, so she kills anyone and everything that gets in her way of getting revenge by killing Namur himself. But when she finally gets Namur in a vulnerable position, she decides that peace is better than spinning in the cycle of revenge. Never mind the fact that you already did hefty amounts of irreparable damage to his life and people, so he has plenty of reason to retaliate against you, the same way you did to him last time he spared your life. If you wanted peace, you probably should have considered that before going to war. She actually starts the film out as an advocate for all things peace and love before her mother dies, so her arc is just her learning to become the perfect person that she already was a couple days ago. Doesn't matter that both sides suffered dozens of losses over this, they will immediately shake hands and say good game. This guy killed your mother, kidnapped you, and he wants to destroy the world because he doesn't like what their ancestors did to each other, and because he doesn't want them to know he exists. But sure, let's go for peace. He definitely won't try to conquer the world again, and future blood he spills certainly won't be on your hands. She invents a new Black Panther purple goo, so she can replace her brother, and she conveniently gets to avoid that whole trial by combat thing they do when they crown a new leader, most likely because she would get snapped like the twig that she is. Now let's shift gears for a moment and talk about some good stuff, because this film wasn't a complete disaster, and does deserve some notes of praise. I mentioned Okoye's fight scene from earlier, which was well made, and there was an attempt to blend practical effects within the CGI at times, which is always appreciated because Marvel CGI is hot trash these days and this film is no exception. The cinematography is generally always on point and pretty creative throughout, and shockingly, the comedy is relatively reserved in this film, which is incredibly rare to find in the modern MCU. There's a handful of bad jokes sprinkled in here and there, but for the most part, the story is taken seriously and played straight. It's not a very good story, but the more serious tone is still appreciated regardless. Lastly, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, that being Chadwick Boseman's death and how it was handled. Handled. This is a tough situation to cover, because almost anything that Marvel does could be construed into being the wrong move. T'Challa dies off screen at the start of the film. They spend a lot of the film's runtime paying tribute to him, and aside from an awkward CGI coffin getting sucked up into a spaceship, his tributes do seem relatively respectful. However, I would argue that the better decision would have been to take some time away from the Black Panther franchise and recast the character later on down the road. T'Challa still has a lot of great stories in him, and letting his character continue would have a better legacy than having him suddenly disappear between films. Films. An argument might be made that it wouldn't be right to replace Chadwick as Black Panther, but he is getting replaced anyway, so you might as well recast the actual character instead of resorting to a hand-me-down. I wouldn't argue with anyone who disagrees with this, because it is a touchy subject.
subject, but that's my take on the matter. Would I recommend this movie to anyone? No, it's not a good film. And it's not a Marvel film. It feels like it was written and produced by people who have no love or care for the source material and would rather be making a film about anything else. So that's what you should do. Watch anything else. They seem to think that these old comics are outdated and don't matter. They think they can make these stories better by changing everything, but in reality, all they're doing is making a cheap imitation. This movie's creators don't care about the stories you enjoy, so why should you care about the stories that they enjoy? When this film gets a commercial release, we will do a full scene-by-scene -scene breakdown so that this thing can have a proper review. But for now, these are my general thoughts. You'll be happy to hear that I've been working on multiple videos at one time, so the next ones might come sooner than you expect. Stay tuned and goodbye for now.